Part 4 Rack on the Beach Bill by John Maysfield He lay dead on the cluttered deck and stared at the cold skies, with never a friend to mourn for him nor a hand to close his eyes. Bill, he's dead, was all they said. He's dead and there he lies. The mate came forward at seven bell and spat across the rail. Just lash him up with some holly stone and a clout of rotten sail. And rot ye and get a gate on ye, you're slower than a bloody snail. When the rising moon was a copper disc and the sea was a strip of steel, we dumped him down to the swaying weeds ten fathom beneath the keel. It's rough about Bill, the forecastle said. We'll have to stand his wheel. Yawn 74, Blue Jay, Merchant. When I left the guard, I was socially worn and beaten. My captain had given me the option to be reduced in grade to E1 and take a 12-month restriction to base or to leave under honorable conditions. It wasn't what I wanted. I carried a sense of pride for my beloved service, but like a majority of my messmates, I left the Coast Guard with my tail between my legs after nearly five years of service. 28 days in a drug and alcohol rehab program were my last days on active duty. Rehab was an obstacle to spending money, and thanks to that, when I left the guard, I had a few thousand bucks to play with. Half went to my wife so she could drive to Florida and fuck her ex. Tears fell when she said she was taking the dog. The other half paid for travels across the country. First touring with David Allen Co., mixing mushrooms and country western. Eventually, I awoke on Blue Jay's porch in Kittery Bay. On his couch, I watched my toes wiggle for months as I spent hundreds of dollars on Oxycontins. It was in that shape of euphoria that I met Ebony, Blue Jay's wife, and their only daughter at the time, Sunshine. The three of them lived in a beautiful cabin by the bay with a huge backyard. We could watch sailboats gracefully move north and south, east over the horizon. Their silhouettes at night, quiet some with loose jibs, flapping, reefed manes, and ten knot breezes. They had another guy living at their house, named Crunchy. Crunchy walked around in a one-piece tie-dyed pajama for my entire stay. When I left Kittery, I was hungry for opiates and had just started my first line of credit, which would last for six months. Blue Jay was a happy, pot-smoking coastie and was considering re-listing after his four years mark which he soon did despite my pushing for him to get out. Two years later, Blue Jay had a second child. Then, right on cue, he was booted from the Coast Guard for popping positive on a urinalysis. After five years in the service, he lost everything he worked towards. Though, thankfully, he left with a resume that helped him land a gig in the Merchant Marines. As a cook for the Sailors Union, Blue Jay transferred from one ship to another. He was often on ships months at a time. Then he'd return home and burn his money. In foreign ports, he'd call, brag about the cleanliness of the cocaine and prostitutes, moral pain, listening to adventures and exotic escapades over the ocean. I'd get jealous. Stuck in San Francisco, I had fathered a child within a year of leaving the guard, who desperately needed me to be home. Pardon my digression, though this child's mother was named Dev, not the bartender Alice. I stayed, inland and near coastal, working locally on whatever boats would have me, mostly ferries. Birdman's stories were more jack than mine, seaward. I was lying in bed dreaming about a peaceful night of sleep when Ebony called in panic. She yelled through the phone, desperately upset. Blue Jay was in a jail in Panama. I knew Blue Jay had gotten a job on a tug and barge and was pulling three months on, three months off rotations. He had expressed his knowledge of the party scene in Panama City, intense, and he was often hanging out with his captain doing blow on watch. He said his ATB was semi permanently moored in a ghetto part of town. When Ebony said he was in jail, I wasn't surprised. When she said that he had called her from the jail and confessed to spending their life savings on cocaine and hookers, I still wasn't surprised, but I felt a little bad for him and for her. Anchors fouled as yawns unraveled and accumulated on the deck over the following week. Turned out that Blue Jay did indeed spend all his pay on drugs and sex. 
After being tossed in jail for possession, he called his wife during his come down and left a message on her voicemail declaring his drug use and infidelity. By no means in his right mind, his strategy of confession ended up costing him his family, house, and bank account. Though in those early weeks, he simply had to focus and get out of jail. He missed movement, his second time, and his last, since joining the union. Not only his job, but his merchant mariner credentials were gone instantly. His elderly father sent bond money in the realm of $5,000, and Blue Jay was free long enough to run over the border and turn himself in at a consulate in Honduras. The story he gave the consulate didn't make much sense, but Blue Jay was suffering from obvious signs of malnourishment and other illnesses, so the consulate flew him home on the U.S. taxpayer's dime, and Blue Jay managed to avoid a lengthy prison sentence in the third world. Footnote 105. Messmates. A shipmate who you have eaten with aboard. Traditionally, a person who is more intimate than just a shipmate. A close friend aboard your vessel. 106. Oxycontin. A brand name for oxycodone. Bliss in pill form. 107. Jib. Forward sail. 108. Reefed. Tucking a fabric away. Sails can be reefed to a specific degree to reduce sail surface or slowdown. A shirt can be reef tucked into pants. 109. ATB. Articulated tug and barge. Where the tug is fastened semi-permanently to the barge via mechanical means. 110. The fouled anchor is a symbol of trial and suffering at sea. It is worn by chiefs in both the U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard. Before the advent of motors, sailing vessels were dependent on their anchors to prevent unwanted drift, like onto a reef or into breaking waves. A filed anchor would have to be cut unless the deck crew were savvy enough to get it back in. Cutting an anchor could mean havoc in the future. Journal Entry September 2010 No more first or last chance at this saloon. I'll take your dollar down for myself. And if your ghost comes stumbling round, I'll put it back on the ship. There's been a fleet of days in the harbor. The old bay is soaked with rain. This coastie's been drinking on Sundays. The sailors been drinking like spring. Come round, you hobos and hookers. I've seen your anchor tattoos. If you'd mourn my friend with me, I'll buy you a round or two. Oh, I'll go to sea a singing. I'll go to sea with glee. I'll go to sea this evening, morning with dirty sailor company. Yawn 75. Nielsen, Coast Guard veteran. Shipmates they come, shipmates they go. Some of us leave the guard with our sea legs under us, ready to conquer, excited. The maritime world is small, and I stumble onto coasties and ex-coasties often. Nielsen left the guard with other than honorable conditions, and enrolled directly into the prestigious California Maritime Academy. But he was missing something. Wit, courage, social skills, skills. It can take years, decades even, for romantic and or intimate couples to open themselves to each other. On a ship's bridge, in the sea of night, on watch, the same release happens with near strangers in a tiny fraction of that time. Pilot house confessions are an important cultural piece of the maritime industry. Nielsen and I met in Anacortes, working on delivery boats, yarning for life. After working isolated with him for almost a year, he unleashed his mind on me. His most shameful, debilitating truth came spilling out. Behavior can be predicted through a number of variables. Genes, culture, birth location, IQ, EQ, family, social status, economic status, education levels, hormones, number of years served in the Coast Guard, type of discharge. Yawns can help us predict. Nielsen's Pilot House Confession There is no greater drive of a man than his sex drive. I had to explain this to my wife for four years after I cheated on her and was caught. You see, I told her, all the guys do it. You've heard of the bars outside of the academy where the wives hang out when the guys are underway. Well, it's true. Women do it too. I didn't do it though, ashore. I never cheated on her. Well, except that one time, but it's not like I fucked anyone. <laughs> I've always been awkward. Katie was only the second woman I've ever made it with. The first girl was some whore at CMA. 
She was such a kink. She only wanted anal. Anal! But yeah, dude, I never got laid. I didn't want to cheat on Katie. All those guys that fuck hookers and cheat on their girlfriends, I hate them. I never wanted to do that. Katie knows it. Okay, so I'll tell you. But you gotta swear you won't repeat this to anyone. No one is sure. You swear? All right, all right. You know that story I told you about why I limp? Why my asshole always hurts? Well, it wasn't because I nicked myself shaving. I made that up. My asshole is hurt, man. Five fucking years I haven't been able to shit right. Okay, so please don't tell anyone. You know how I told you that I always have Katie take a strap onto me? Well, we haven't done that in years, dude. I want it so bad, but my sphincter is ripped. All right, uh, so it was Bangkok. I was on a three-month deployment as a third mate. The entire trip, the only talk on the bridge was about fucking whores. Everyone. Fuck this, fuck that. It's so cheap. It was gross. I was emailing Katie every night and jerking off like crazy. When we hit port, I went out with a bunch of ABs. We got fucking lit and they went out to this whorehouse and I just followed them. Dude, uh, I let some little Asian bitch take a strap onto me. She had me bent over and she couldn't get it in. I asked her to stop, but she just rammed it in. My fucking asshole ripped, dude. I seriously cried for an hour in that fucking whorehouse. I limped outside to a taxi at 3 a.m. and had to explain to my chief mate why I was going to the hospital. Then I lied. I said I had food poisoning. I went to a hotel and called Katie and cried and came clean with her. She hung up on me and then wouldn't answer the phone. I bought plane tickets the next day and flew straight home and walked into an emergency room. I lied to the doctors for months and said that I took a really big shit. And that's why my ass was ripped. Katie wouldn't let me tell the truth. She said it didn't matter. But when I finally told a surgeon what had happened, he said that an impact tear is different from a pressure tear. To this day, I have scar tissue from them sewing my sphincter back together. Jack, seriously, never put anything in your ass unless it goes in easy. I feel horrible. I never wanted to cheat. We never have sex anymore. I haven't used a butt plug or been fucked in years. Footnote 111. CMA, California Maritime Academy. One of the seven federally acknowledged and subsidized maritime academies. 112. AB. Able-bodied seaman. An entry-level position in the maritime. Geared towards deck work. Yawn 76. Gilmore. Petty Officer First Class. His email said he was reporting to Alameda in a month. The tone of the letter seemed like it was in a boilerplate format, though I was excited nonetheless. It had been five years since I last saw Gilmore in San Diego. His new wife and him were driving out in a U-Haul, and they would need help moving everything into their apartment. It'll be a good time to drink and catch up, wrote Gilmore. In the years since the thrill, we had only spoken sporadically and mostly by email. He'd aged and become more private. Wise is a fair descriptor, but authentic was always my favorite. Gilmore had a hell of a career since we last parted, and he was on the fast track towards Chief and beyond. When he opened the moving truck's door, I was caught off guard by the expensive furniture. We spoke a few friendly words as we schlepped boxes and crates inside, but apparently it wasn't a good time to catch up, as he and his wife Amy needed to settle in. We can catch up next week, I offered. Or the week after, he suggested. Or whenever. I'll be pretty busy. Yawn 77. Bradley Green. Gilmore's return was anticlimactic. After leaving Blue Jay in Maine, meeting the mother of my children, and starting to work on ferries, I had mostly lost contact with my Coast Guard connections. Every so often, I'd meet a veteran, I anticipated more debauchery and adventure with Gilmore, though he seemed to be over that phase of his life. That is, until he called me and gave me an offer. If I would be the designated driver for him and his group of Coasties, he would buy me a ticket to the Grateful Dead reunion show. As a matter of principle, I hadn't cut any of my hair since leaving the guard. It was to my nipples and my beard was to my belly button. Gilmore had landed a government vehicle for his outing, and he passed the keys to me when he got to my place. Five other neatly trimmed guys were in the van, sitting in silence, pondering Gilmore's decision to let some hobo drive a GV. Once we parked, I took off to find party favors on the lot, 
and soon found a handful of balloons. With a previously purchased 12-pack tucked under my shirt, I skillfully walked by all the security to search for my straight-edge friends. At the entrance to the stadium, a temporary fence corralled thousands of hippies through a security checkpoint. To draw the attention of my crew, who had my ticket, I jumped the fence and stood in the middle of the open area it created. Gilmore! Again at the expense of my lungs. Gilmore! It seemed useless, and I instantly became aware of the possibility of security barring me from entry. My mind piped the decision to inhale all the balloons before I was caught. Fuck it. Inhale. My attempt to sit failed and I fell to the ground in a moment of disheveled bliss. There, I watched a balloon I had just untied rush through the air like a mad bug. Other balloons started drifting upwards. A hand came into view. It snatched one of the balloon strings from the air. And then that hand had a smiling face attached to it. And a second hand reached down towards me. Hi, I'm Bradley. The smiling face said, and I was jerked to my feet. He then proceeded to untie the balloon he had rescued and huffed it down. My last bit of nitrous. Gilmore's right over there. None of the other pussies would jump the fence, so I had to come get you. Footnote 113. The Lot. Short for the parking lot at a Grateful Dead event, a.k.a. Shakedown Street. It is known as a safe place to find drugs, munchies, and, if needed, to trip balls. Yawn 78. Donovan, Petty Officer 3rd Class. Donovan and I first met at my daughter's second birthday. He arrived with his cousin, my good friend Gilmore, Obviously a man of many interests, including music, Donovan became a face I would see often. Hanging out the bars in Petaluma and cafes around the Bay Area, Donovan would spend his off time from his Coast Guard duties playing blues and rock music on his electric acoustic. To be blunt, behind a guitar he sounded like a fat black man out of the Mississippi Delta or Adam Haworth Stevens singing, I found a love. I loved it. Take the stage away and the guitar, and Donovan sat back down into a normal straight out of boot camp coasty attitude. He was proud of making it through Coast Guard basic training, which made him hesitant to move forward in his music career. At the time, he was attending a communications A school in Petaluma. Donovan was more or less quiet and distant in social scenes until you asked him something slightly political or philosophical. And that's what I did often. We built our relationship over Donovan's armchair philosophies. Through the course of a year, Donovan and I became closer and closer. He would come to my house and we would jam on the porch for hours as my daughter climbed around and tried to dance. He was also a drinker, and we would drive around the foggy coastal roads of Moran and Sonoma looking for dive bars and cafes to crash. At some point, Donovan was given orders to Hawaii, and he, like all shipmates do, weighed anchor and drifted away, and again I felt that subtle feeling of both loneliness and fear of missing the excitement. Hawaii, just imagine. Before Donovan left, Gilmore bought us tickets to a multi-day concert in the city as a farewell offering. During this period of my life, I had mostly no time away from my daughter. Any partying was done with her nearby. I hadn't really gone into a binge for months, and so that was my plan. In the field in front of the Bill Graham venue, I strolled looking for any and whatever drugs I could find. Xanax was on the menu that night, and I scored four pills from some street kid. The night was amazing, and I danced my heart out, enjoying everything. Gilmore was enjoying the party with me, though Donovan was skeptical about trying a new drug, so he stayed sober. The following morning, my guilt was overwhelming and my energy exhausted. Gilmore and Donovan were still eager for me to go to the second night show, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. The mother of my daughter, Dev, decided to take my ticket and take a night off for her own peace of mind. I stayed home and focused on being a good dad. When I awoke the next morning, Dev wasn't home. With a baby who needed breast milk and a limited supply of frozen milk to give, I was pretty irate at Dev when she arrived the next afternoon completely hammered from the night before, like she had been tossed around by a tornado. She cried when she confessed to consuming a bunch of molly and she wouldn't be breastfeeding our kid for a few days. That disaster was not what our relationship needed at the time. I was too self-centered to manage any part of it. 
including my own emotions. And off Donovan went to Hawaii. Dev and I went on to have a beautiful second child. And Donovan went on to marry a beautiful Hawaiian girl named Jess. Life went on and it did its thing. Dev and I started fighting heavily and I left her with the intent of spending only quality time with the kids and bettering myself. Again. Footnote 114. Molly. Another name for MDMA. Ecstasy. Journal entry, October 2010. Lois called me today. I haven't spoken to her since an awkward encounter on the banks of Lake Superior. She said that Stagger shot himself dead. She sobbed into the phone so I didn't catch everything she said. Not that I cared to. She told me to check out the San Diego papers. It took a few seconds to Google it. Holy fucking shit. Yawn 79, Bradley Green. The non-skid felt the same. The watertight door was latched open, though I noticed its dogs were all attached to a quick-acting lever. I could imagine Mr. B giving a rambling lecture on Costa Rican culture. Deck four sitting stiff, cross-legged. Kurtz leaning against fire locker number one. Lee with dark shades chewing on gum. Ray poking some new girl in the back. I could imagine Gilmore and Blue Jay, half asleep, ready to hide in dry stores. But now, it was Bradley doing the talking. With a small afro and a Nike shirt, he didn't look the part. He smiled at me. I wasn't moving, just zoning out. Jack! I looked up and smiled. Sorry, just reminiscing. Come on, man, let's smoke up here. Shut that hatch real quick so we can hear if anybody's coming. I hadn't smoked weed on a boat since Alaska, ten years before when paranoia cost me an entire evening. But Bradley had this endearing quality about him that made me relax and want to do what he was doing. As we moved forward of the boats and hold, the 1MC came on. Now hear this, all family members please. Bradley started dogging the hatch mid-announcement I couldn't hear what was being asked of us. Don't you want to hear that? Nah, I don't give a shit to you. I guess not. We moved forward one last door and we were standing above a hazmat locker. I told Bradley the story of Huff and Green Death in the paint locker. Memories were racing through my head. He started taking puffs and passed the joint my way. Our children were on the mess deck, playing pin the tail on the pirate or something similar. When Bradley invited me to come to the ship for his wife's open house, I wanted to say no, but he said it would be a great time for the kids to hang out, and I was a bit curious to see what had changed since I left the guard. It was also fun to walk around the Coast Guard Cutter High with a giant beard and a belly full of beer. I was too high and began feeling paranoid. Bradley noticed right away. Hey man, ha, don't worry about anything, you're good. Just follow my lead and we'll get the kids and head to the softball field to kick around a ball or something. We strolled back through the 378 like we owned the place. We ran into Bradley's wife, Holly, and one of her shipmates on the second deck. They had just walked out of a birthing area. An awkward moment of uneasiness. I could tell Bradley was tense too but we all smiled and went up towards the mess deck. Yawn ate it. Girth. Deckhand. His name wasn't Girth, but he asked us to call him Girth, so we did. Girth wasn't the first sailor I met with major penis disproportionalism. A decade earlier, I was at the MLEU, where I had a locker assigned between two guys with dongs roughly 10 inches soft. Jacob on my left, and Rossi on my right. Jacob on my left side was a big old teddy bear guy who said he couldn't have sex with his wife while she was pregnant. He had a dick that was easily the size of a ruler. On my right, Rossi, whose dick could wrap around his entire wrist and then some. Rossi was a fan of placing his member on bars, hanging out naked everywhere he wouldn't get arrested, and making fun of me in the locker room. Oh, look at that little guy, he must be shy. Rossi was a short, funny Italian fucker. A few years before meeting those horse-like guys, I had a few run-ins with penises at boot camp. Our company colors carrier used to walk around the shower room saying, Gangway got it on, while he had an erect penis. I don't know how anyone could get a boner in the shower room at boot camp. There was a boot camp erection exception. Morning wood was common the week of our graduation. Just like every morning, we would be woken at reveille by our company commanders, 
whistles blowing, general shouting, shit being thrown across the room. We would jump out of our racks and line the center aisle. After a few moments, the females of our company would arrive, walk swiftly down the center aisle, and arrange themselves in line at the far side of the barracks. The company commanders would then commence barraging us with orders, insults, and belittling comments. During the last week, everything was the same, except when we jumped out of our racks, the majority of us had morning wood, which is plausible due to the excitement of the coming graduation. When the ladies of the company walked by us, there were chants from both the women and us, Gangway got ons! But girth was different. His dick wasn't that long. It was just thicker than a Coke can. You could just look at the thing beside a can of cola and tell. Footnote 115. Company colors. Each unit is provided with a flag, normally signal flags, which is symbolic of that unit and its mission slash purpose. A guide on is the staff that the unit's flag is carried on. Yawn 81. Gilmore. Petty Officer of First Class. Sandals, blue V-neck t-shirts, and blue ODU pants. The off-duty uniform of both Gilmore and Donovan. Donovan carried a guitar at all times. I wore a beard and sandals, short shorts, and old faded blue t-shirts. We sat around talking philosophy, politics, music. They had grown up around each other and had experiences I could never imagine. But I saw Gilmore on the thrill. Donovan's experiences here, in San Francisco and Petaluma, was nothing to what Gilmore and I experienced on the boat. The drink seemed to hit me first, always, in a group. Boisterously, I'd look for excitement and promote adventure. Donovan was slow to respond, though we'd get there with drink. Gilmore and Amy would leave, saying something about drinking and having to work the next day. Donovan and I would stumble to a park, lean against some old oak tree, and sing songs. Donovan full of soul, me, full of worry and regret. Gilmore was the only shipmate I've stayed in touch with who made it past his second tour and into the path of retirement. He used to joke about people who would stay in, lifers, worried about being conditioned. But none of us ever believe we are conditioned, and Gilmore doesn't think he is now. Maybe he's not. He's successful, nope. Footnote 116, ODU, Operational Dress Uniform. Yawn 82, Blue Jay. With a warrant out for his head in Panama and all territories that ally with Panama, except the U.S., Blue Jay's ability to travel for work was shot. Being excommunicated from the maritime unions and losing his maritime credentials just sealed the deal. Back home, he moved in on his brother's couch and found a bar lawyer to fight his child custody case. Soon, it was finalized. Blue Jay lost all rights to see his children, was issued a restraining order against his wife and kids, and was levied a child support payment of half of what he made in the Merchant Marines. Blue Jay went from coasty extraordinaire to homeless, familyless, and drug addict in the course of a few years. A manifested epidemic of deterioration hit Blue Jay in waves, week after week. In a fury of opium-induced angst, he jumped out of the third-story window of his halfway house. Before pussying out and going feet first, instead of the other way, he called me and shouted his plans into my eardrum. I called the local police in Connecticut, and they found him lying on the sidewalk with a broken back, bruised spleen, smashed legs, and concussion. In his apartment, they also found a plethora of drugs and paraphernalia. And unfortunately for Blue Jay, he called his ex-wife like he had called me, which meant he violated his restraining order. After three months in a medical facility, he was released to a psychiatric facility and awaited trial for various accounts of drug possession, assault, and violation of parole. After a year of further torment, suicide attempts, withdrawal, and relapse, Blue Jay was sentenced to a five-year stint in state prison. After three, he was released on good behavior and he moved to the Bay Area, where our mutual friend Gilmore was just about to pack up his bags and move away. Gilmore's farewell party was Blue Jay's arrival party. We were sympathetic with Blue Jay and extended all the help we could give him. Knowing he was using, I couldn't spend too much time near him. 
working at the Ferry Building in downtown San Francisco, I was able to catch up with him often on my way home from school or work. He'd talk about the fat girl he was fucking, the dyke bitch who sold him dope, the shows he couldn't afford to go to. His hair was inches longer each time I saw him, his face more somber, big dark sunglasses and a cigarette. We'd lean against the railing, back to the bay, and watch passerbys, laugh about the old times, Mr. B, Gilmore, Clark, Lois. I lost my job after I threatened to whack the vessel manager in his scrawny little chin. Blue Jay lost his because he didn't show up. Unemployed, we'd sit at the Iron Horse Saloon in Berkeley, getting reduced-priced beers from the bartender. Every now and then, one of us would joke about sucking his dick as a tip, and one of us would consider it. More jobs come and go, relationship explosions, loneliness, struggle, addictions, melanoma skin accumulating, marks and folds. Hang out beneath the UC Berkeley Lighthouse, the Campanile. Look up and the sky and clouds spin counterclockwise beyond the mighty 307-foot white stone structure. Stare at college girls through dark glasses. Hold coffee mugs like their railings. Chain smoke. Reminiscing like old men over a game of chess. Just with no game of chess and nothing to say. Our egos fade in and out. Two wobbly steps forward, two steps back. Find a sea stance, weight loss, exposed bones, coffee, cigarettes, no ashtrays in Berkeley, no railing to flick the butts over, watch them float away in the wavy green grass, never speak of our children. His cane is a carved piece of teak jetsa, red in the shape of an anchor chain. He limps. Now, I pick him up at the marina. Meander like an old river down the wooden docks when he's not in the parking lot. Each old rickety float leans, forces creaks and wobbles. Gall shit and shells. Low tide. Blue Jay walks with a straight leg. Hair to his lower back. Beard to his lower belly. Big dark shades. Always in long sleeves. Even in hot weather. Cigarettes flying out the window as we drive around the back streets. Browsing the corners. Footnote 117, Jetsam. Objects jettison overboard which have turned to debris and washed ashore. Yawn 83, Donovan, GM2. Misery Lounge had an open mic night I'd stumbled to from my little studio basement apartment. Regular enough so they wouldn't throw me out unless I was too drunk to talk right. They let me play Bob Dylan tunes, pretend to be sober, pretend to be Dylan. The bar owner was covered in tattoos, swallows and anchors, a whale across his lower back, props on his ass cheeks. His wife had the word ship on her right butt cheek, and he had the word mates on his left butt cheek. If they mooned you at the same time beside each other, I'd read shipmates, but I normally only saw ship. During the day, I was doing contract work at marinas. Anything that had to do with fixing and mending boats, diving, painting, rigging, and even piloting became my day-to-day. -day. At some point, I had scored a captain's gig with a wealthy guy out of Sausalita, and he would throw huge cocaine parties like we were in the 70s on his 50-foot yacht as I would drive us around the bay. I still knew a lot of the Coast Guard small boat members in that community, and I could often fend off boardings before they happened just by radio chatter. And boardings were a lot more common in those days. On vessels, there are no rules about drinking while driving, only driving while intoxicated. So I'd often antagonize the Coasties by holding up a bottle as they slowly cruised past. This made my supercargo always laugh, and he kept me on because I showed an edge of confidence mixed with recklessness. Both skill sets needed to maintain control on a vessel full of coked-up wealthy white trash. And this was my situation when Donovan moved back to the area. Jess and Donovan were living in Coast Guard housing and I was in my Berkeley basement. Somehow I managed to own a small sailboat during this time period of my life. And when Donovan contacted me, I demanded that him and his wife go sailing with me and the kids, which is what we did. This instantly turned into a three-way friendship between Donovan, Jess, and their dog. I was happy to have a social outlet in my life I could relate to. Donovan was stationed on a sister ship of the Thrill while he was in Hawaii and had traveled to many of the same port calls and seas that I had. We talked about the craziness of shipboard life, the swaying of the ship, 
and the disasters of Coast Guard politics and management styles. Donovan set up a man cave in his garage at Coast Guard Housing, and he used it as a place to get smashed and type away at an ancient typewriter he was obsessed with. A fan of Jack Kerouac, Donovan wanted to make every aspect of life an adventure, something we both had in common. About a year after the move into the Bay Area, Jess and Donovan's relationship started fraying. Under Jess's desires, the relationship opened and Jess started seeing other men. Donovan explained to me that Jess had a lot of bad history, like family issues and marrying a homosexual Navy guy just to help him out. I watched Donovan go through a hell, a hell that seems all too typical of relationships in the maritime. You fall in love, you rabbit and rave in the sack, you leave on a ship, you come back and find yourself alone with a woman in your pocket and a stranger's dick on your mantle. Donovan couldn't get Jess out of his head, and Jess needed Donovan's income to pay the bills. They were living separately. Donovan found escape in liquor, and Jess found escape in friends. Donovan started gaining weight, and he was drenched and sweat each time I saw him. He'd pace the rooms and climb the walls, searching for some exit. I'd seen guys hurt and fall apart, though Donovan was different. His emotions were always turned in like he was a sado-narcissist, devouring his body's attempt to produce serotonin by flogging it with vodka. He would ramble incoherently about his love for Jess and his need to have her back. Then he started talking about suicide. He couldn't deal with his head anymore. Then he self-reported to the Coast Guard. When you turn yourself into the Coast Guard and say things like, I am drinking too much, or I'm going to fucking kill myself, for whatever reason, the Coast Guard reacts in a pre-formatted way, policy before variables. The first step is preservation, then rehabilitation, then more preservation. During the rehabilitation portion of the ride, Donovan suppressed memories surfaced and he was exposed to a torrential and violent storm. Turns out Donovan joined the Coast Guard to get away from his grotesquely abusive Carolinian family. His escape led him to sea life, trapped between the melancholy ocean and hundreds of uniformed seamen. His romantic visions of being a sailor failed him and he sought refuge with women. Jess. When Jess failed him, he sought refuge with alcohol. Then he relapsed to seek help from the Coast Guard. And the story may repeat itself. Once again, I found myself wondering about the nature of Coasties. My Coast Guard days are over, yet here I am, amongst them. Long lost yarns resurfacing like a suppressed childhood horror. What type of people am I surrounding myself around? Why do I surround myself with them? These bodies pile up like rack on a beach. Footnote 118. Supercargo. The owner or stockholder of a vessel. A person of seniority above the captain, but not in charge of the vessel. Yawn 84. Bradley. Yeoman, third class. In World War II, the most dangerous job an American could have was in the Merchant Marines. The second most dangerous job was in the U.S. Coast Guard. In 2003, the Coast Guard left the Department of Transportation and became the tip of the spear for the Department of Homeland Security. We were both there for the change. Literally, we changed from blue janitor uniforms to more stylish ODUs. The bow of each ship was stripped of its rescue swimmer davit and a 50 cal mount was installed in its place. Bradley was wearing a Coast Guard shirt, which cleverly snuck in the words, Come in to save the motherfucking day, into the Coast Guard shield. We sat on his couch, pounding beers. One of Holly's shipmates, Jerry, was going through a divorce and was living with Bradley and Holly in their guest bedroom for months. In post-9-11 DHS Coast Guard, deployments were more frequent and lasted for longer periods of time. Holly and Jerry were drinking tequila in celebration of returning from one of these deployments. Bradley and I paid for a sitter to watch our kids all day and night. The Women's World Cup was blasting on the big screen and we were all pretty well lit by halftime. Other friends and neighbors wandered over and there was more drinking and eating. Jerry and Holly were in the kitchen a majority of the night and I could feel the tension radiating from Bradley. The game ended in a major upset when the U.S. team lost in an overtime shootout. Shots were brought out and the night drifted in. Bradley, Jerry, and I were in the kitchen poking at chips and booze. Holly came out of nowhere, wearing nothing but panties and a bra, her long legs taunting us with purpose. Bradley yelled before I could process her entrance, Get some fucking clothes on, woman! 
You're not my fucking father, Bradley. Babe, you can't just walk around like this. It's my fucking house, Bradley. I'll do what I want when I want. Her tone was of a raving drunk woman. She was flaunting her body to Jerry in front of Bradley. Oh, shit. I said, get the fuck back in the bedroom. Fuck you. Get your hands off me. Jerry jumped in. Get your hands off her, man. Stay the fuck out of this, Jerry. This is my wife. Holly. Fuck you, Bradley. You're not my fucking boss. I could find no solid footing, and my sea legs were useless in those types of situations. Bouncing back and forth, horribly uncomfortable. Jerry was wrong. Holly was wrong. Bradley was frantic. He wanted it all to stop. He responded too loudly with aggression. Jerry, let them figure it out, dude. Let's get out of here. We left the couple yelling at each other. I watched Jerry walk stiffly and with malice through the living room. He manhandled a half an empty glass of beer with one hand as he chugged a gulp of tequila with the other. He stared at me with evil thoughts. Then he disappeared into his guest room. I walked out to my truck and lit a cigarette, too drunk to see the night. I was startled when the passenger door flew open. Bradley jumped in. Let's go. Where to, my man? Bar. Bar is closed. You got any booze at home? Yep. Tequila? Only. Yawn 85. Jerry. Petty officer, second class. They knew each other for nearly a year. Jerry watched Bradley rejoin the guard. After being a stay-at-home dad for two years, Jerry knew all of Bradley's secrets. All of them. He knew there was a fake rubber penis that excreted fake urine in Bradley's locker on base. When Jerry's affair with Holly became more than just about sex, he wrote an anonymous letter to Bradley's command. To Coast Guard Pacific Command. Petty Officer Bradley Green smokes marijuana daily. He has a fake urine device in his personal locker in the gym on base. I prefer to keep myself anonymous as I work with Petty Officer Green. Regards. When Bradley was processed for discharge, his paperwork read, Bad Conduct for Falsifying Government Documents. Jerry fucked Bradley's wife each and every day for 28 days while Bradley was locked in rehab. He even made Bradley's kids cereal each morning. Later, Jerry moved Bradley's things out of his house and onto the curb. He then packed all his personal stuff into the room with Holly, in the drawers that used to be Bradley's. He even managed to get transfer orders to the same city as Holly a year later, New Orleans. Yawn 86, Rambo. We used to strap our children to our backs and fish at a reservoir behind the Oakland Hills. We both grew up fishing lakes, though reservoirs in California had more regulations than we were used to. So the catches were rare, but we weren't really there for that anyways. Before we became overwhelmed with parenting, Rambo would take us out on the San Francisco Bay on his homemade boat. He had built a 20-foot plywood and fiberglass boat in his garage over the course of a few months. If I didn't see him build it, I would have assumed he'd bought it off the shelf. He had skills and patience with projects like that. Out on the bay, we would fish for leopard sharks. Always launching in the mornings before the sun was up, we'd take off with a cooler full of beer and gas station breakfast sandwiches. The wind starts howling near noon in the Bay Area, and we were always back at the loading ramp by then, drunken and tired. We kept shock, though we'd mostly reminisce about our younger days. He left honorably at the end of his four-year tour. He joined for the GI Bill, and he left on schedule. Rambo was an example of the few who actually do this. A large percentage of veterans never use their GI Bill. Others can't seem to graduate. Rambo, like me, did both while starting a family. As our friend slowly transferred out of the Bay Area, Rambo became inclined to stay at home with his healthy and attractive wife. Other than a sporadic fishing trip, we only stayed in touch by texting grotesque photos back and forth. When he wasn't a tornado driver, he was a role model of balance and progress. The last shipmate. You get the fuck out of here and don't come back, pervert. I looked across the street in the direction of the shouting. I had been searching the streets of Petaluma for a half an hour for Rambo. There he was, stumbling, tottering on the curb, leaning dangerously into oncoming traffic. Little control of his body, top-heavy with a big wind. Three sheets to it. Yo, Rambo! Run, fucker! The truck's right here! He saw me and darted into the road car went into a skid. Rambo slammed his fist onto the car's hood like Donkey Kong. 
He aggressively yelled something no one could understand, then bolted across the remaining portion of the street, dodging a second vehicle and horrified driver. I yelled towards him. This way, dude! He ran towards me, jumped in my truck, and I hit the gas onto the main road. My left eye was closed to block out the double vision, and my right hand alternated between the gear shift and wheel while my left hand held a cigarette out the window. The on-ramp to Highway 101 had a slow mover on it, so I used the emergency lane to speed around him. Fucking bad drivers, man. Rambo was abnormally silent, and I turned up the radio. We didn't talk for the next five minutes. Hey, you really like this song, huh? Yeah, man, this is my shit. And he turned it off and looked out the passenger window without talking. The Petaluma trip was the last time I saw him. A month later, I called asking if he wanted to go fish the Delta. Hey, dude, long time no see. Uh, no, I'm actually in Iowa right now. Yeah, we bought a house and everything. Hey, man, can I call you back? I gotta grab one of the kids real quick. Yawn 87. Gilmore, Chief. Gilmore advanced to Chief recently. The Coast Guard sent him to Petaluma for pipeline training. This gave me the opportunity to hang out with the guy a little bit more, and the both of us looked much more defeated by life since we last departed. The drill was 15 years earlier, and I had been separated from Dev by five years. Gilmore and I weren't our mid-thirties, and life was moving fast. And though we both had love for sea and beer, our attitude towards responsibility and risk were different. I brought up the drill in conversation, and he soured. Said he'd rather forget it. He calls us... Dumb kids. Sure. I'm going to be a chief now. I've done this stuff for 15 years and I'm over the games. This is my life. The Coast Guard's been good to me. It's been good to my family and the people I love. Fucking kids that join these days are worthless. No wonder Mr. B was always an asshole. I sat quietly. Yawn 88. Charles Black. He sits and stares. Face a mess of hair. Post photo after photo after photo of orange and red sunsets on Instagram. Drinks malt liquor driving down the back swamp roads. Through the bio. Says friendly things to strangers. Sometimes comprehensible. Sometimes a slur of mumbled thank you ma'ams. He now works for the military sea lift command. Two weeks on, two weeks off. When he's off, he lives in a trailer just above the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi. From Charles's porch, you can watch tugs with barge trains move up and down the river. It's a good spot for Charles to sit, drink reindeer beer, and talk about his kid. Charles's last duty station in the Coast Guard was in Port Angeles, Washington. When Charles got kicked out of the Guard for his first DUI, Charles and his pregnant girlfriend moved to a pot farm in an old logging field. When the child was born and his mother wouldn't stop using drugs, Charles got pissed and used a family loan to pay for a lawyer. In the eyes of Washington, Charles was the worst of the two parents. His other-than-honorable discharge didn't help, and custody was mostly awarded to the mother. Charles was granted partial custody and is allowed to have his son during the summer months. Eight years after that decree, Charles sits on his porch and laughs about the system that screwed him. When he's not in a way with the MSC, Charles has a ritual in his home by the river. He chugs beer and crushes the cans into a ball with one hand, throws the garbage into a corner of his kitchen, and repeats the process until his sister-in-law cleans up the mess when he flies away for his next two weeks underway. On his boat, he drinks in isolation, throws his trash overboard when no one is looking. Then he posts photos of the sea on his Instagram account. Back in the Coast Guard, Charles was the guy who wouldn't let anyone out drink him. He would drink while he was throwing up. In the MSC, he says he's protected by the unions, and as long as he shows up, he won't get fired. Shit, Charles says. The operator gets fucked up with me on watch. Ha <laughs> ha. Yawn 89, Georgia, AMTC. Georgia was stationed in San Francisco. I only knew this because we were friends on Facebook. He never responded to my messages, until randomly he reached out to me and asked if I would meet him in Sausalito for a drink. He apologized for the gap in communications. Curious, I had no reason not to go. 
Georgie used to be one of my best friends, and I always felt guilt for the way we left our friendship. Me taking a cheap swing at him because he had received orders to school before me. So I found a sitter for the kids and headed for Sausalita. Across the water, Alcatraz Lighthouse was accentuated as the halfway point between us and the city. Drinks in hand, we were sitting on a quay wall in Sausalito, exactly where sitting on the dock of the bay was written 50 years earlier. San Francisco's lights were clear and the lighthouse was abnormally bright each time it flashed. The container ship in the outbound lane was moving fast and would soon be between us and the infamous island. Clanks and creaks from the wooden dock below as it lightly rocked against the piling. The night had gone as expected. Two old friends meeting in an awkward way, drinking beers, small and indifferent words. Sure, you remember when I left the drill? You were pissed that I had orders before you. I looked at his face meaningfully for the first time in ages, knowing he was saying something significant. It was dated without joy. Man... I was the one that botched your paperwork. When we signed up for school together, the BM1 told us that only one of us would get orders. But I knew you didn't hear. I finagled my orders to the top of the pile. I'm sorry, man. Caught off guard, I looked down at the water below us. That had been so long ago. My night went from awkward to comfortably jacked to awkward again. Silence. That's not all. A few weeks after AMT school started, some shit went down. I've never told anyone ashore. My doctor thinks I should apologize to you so I can move forward in my recovery. I've kept it hidden from everybody for years. It's the most fucked thing that could happen to somebody. Embarrassing, painful, fucking awful, man. I never notified the command and no one on the thrill knew. I had no idea what he was talking about. I was about to tell him I didn't care, that I loved my last years in the Coast Guard and was thankful, if anything, of the way it turned out. But he started talking again. You remember a few years back, a Coast Guard investigator questioned you about me? I had forgotten about it, but it came rushing back to me. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, I was drinking when they called. I remember clearly now, yeah, something about a security clearance. The questioning was really a gauge of my personality. They were trying to gather intel on me to know if they should take my word for the truth. He sighed. For sure, I was raped by a group of Navy guys in Norfolk. More silence. My class flew to the naval air station there to train on carriers. A group of guys jumped on me in the barracks. I was drinking, as normal, and a bunch of guys invited me to their dorm. When I got there, one of them just pounced on me. They fucking raped me, man. He stopped talking. His head was bent down. We sat still. I couldn't say anything other than, Fuck, dude. I'm, I'm sorry. The dock kept rocking below us. The lighthouse flashed. The city was now submerged in fog. The passing ship was gone. Yawn 90. Bradley Green. On the streets, out of the guard, no more boats. For five years, Bradley struggled to make sense of it all. He started couch surfing, watching his wife and her lover transfer and move into an apartment together. He followed to be near his kids. Bottles of liquor every day, starting early. Drunken calls. Hey, uh, I'm a desperate, despairing drunkard. Dancing in the hall, hands overhead. Diamond shaped like a pig ballerina. Who are we? Bradley? Gilmore? Donovan? Spinning? 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 We dreamed of sober seas. Never afraid of living. Your love left ashore. My love left. Suffer. Pathetic on the docks below. Bubbling beer stains your upper lip. Amber. It's aerated your brain. Who are you? Bradley, did she fuck him? Did he fuck her? Does it make you think? We run the trail, sleep the night cold. Whiskey doesn't freeze, dehydrated to spare. What did they do on deployment? Fucking the line locker, quick to come. Juices everywhere. She was my wife. I can see her face. What did she want from the sea? That was my escape. He met guys who were making it big in the California pot industry. And success followed. Excitement and money, orgies with big cowboy dick southerners, access to his kids and wife waned. He was driving through Texas at the nighttime speed. Traffic stopped on the freeway and there were drug dogs, sniffing all the cars, arrested for drug trafficking, a hundred pounds of marijuana stuffed in a duffel bag, 
which had a Coast Guard patch, shield and anchors, sewn just above an old flated black stencil that read, S.A.B. Green. I speak with Bradley a few times a year through slow mail. He received a 15-year sentence from a voting population who wears synthetic clothing and plastic cowboy hats, spun, no doubt, on plastic yarns. Four years in the U.S. Coast Guard, submerged in Dirty Sailor Company every step of the way. Maybe your prison room suite will be on an island, of you a faithful gauze flying through the glass sea like skies. Yawn 91. Georgia, gone. Sitting on a boat, swaying side to side, smelling the life of morning low tide. First he floats, then he sinks. On the rail I sit and thinks. We tried to rekindle our friendship while he lived in the city. We went to a few Grateful Dead cover shows together, stumbling around like we had aged 20 years since the San Diego adventures. And as time went on, our friendship grew. Always slightly despondent, Georgia never said much more about what was on his mind other than comments about music. Journal entry. My first concert was with Georgia at the Forum in Los Angeles, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I think I picked up Anthony Kiedis' autobiography because he is back in town. Kiedis is a madman, reminds me of Bradley's energy level, paranoid on pot, addicted to everything, go, go, go. Georgia brought up the New Year's Dead show in Oakland, 2003-2004. I didn't think he remembered it like me. Dancing, clowns, ballerinas, midgets, a double dose of mushrooms. First eighth didn't work. Second eighth kicked in as we started feeling the first one. Running up the handicap ramp. Spinning with fat girl. Georgia on the floor. I see my hand reach for his chest. He doesn't move. Panic. Stand up. Head down. Walk away. I hear people say... Oh my God, he's just leaving his friend there. I sit and put my head in my lap. Georgia walked over. Hey, fucker, we gotta get out of here. He was alive. More midgets on the train, dodging burning traffic cones on the freeway. Georgia shaking his head. You left me for dead, fucker. In the course of a year, our friendship had grown again. He called me out at the bar one night. And when I said I had the kids, he asked in a serious way if I could get a babysitter. He said he had developed colon cancer which was most likely the result of HPV, perhaps from being fucked by the Navy. He reached out to me after his doctors had given him a poor survival percentage. The tumor in his colon was successfully removed, though the blood tests six months afterwards were bad. The cancer was back and spreading rapidly. Georgia sent me a sealed envelope with directions to open it in the event his mother contacted me. He was put on a harsh regina chemo weekend and died at the age of 35. I've sat so many times under the Golden Gate Bridge, in pea soup fog, listening to the sound of the horn in the fog, smelling low tide, rocking with the hair of the dog. Never thought I'd have to do it while my friend's nephew dumped ashes into the outgoing tide, just like Jerry Garcia. I had snuck a CD player on board and turned the volume up on, he's gone, as the ashes drifted away, as his letter asked. Each and every face on board took the music in stride, and with a smile. Rat in a drain ditch, dogs in a pile, nothing left to do but smile, smile, smile. Yawn 92, Stagger Lee, Coast Guard vet. I liked Stagger, I still do. I liked the idea of him, on a boat for years and he never saw the water. When I left the thrill, I never looked back and I never spoke the name Stagger again until Lois called me. I read the article after I hung up on Lois. Memories flooded my brain, staggering shades, leaning in the boats and hole, staggering latex gloves, on hands and knees, cleaning. Stagger brushing his teeth, stagger cooking rice, sriracha sauce at the ready. Stagger in a dark parking lot, leans in my window and smiles really big. Stagger with a sidearm, press uniform, straight face, hard jaw, clenched smirk. Mr. B's ceremonious dance, honoring the long-term decky for his style and swagger. Swagger Stagger Lee. The San Diego Yellow Press. While defending his drug network in adobe, 
Stagger Lee barricaded himself in his home with his girlfriend. The police became fed up with his antics and crashed down his front door. Stagger ran for his bedroom with his girlfriend, chased by a canine named Dante. He stabbed the pursuing dog more than 20 times. The first cop burst through the door, which was not dogged properly, and Stagger shot him center mass. The officer fell. His partners retreated. Lying on the floor, the officer raised his gun again and looked up to see Stagger and his girlfriend panting. Adios, bandito, was the cleverest thing Stagger thought to say before shooting the cop again, this time in the head. His girlfriend was screaming, ah, ah, distraught from years of social dissonance and methamphetamine abuse. Stagger couldn't concentrate and he shot her too. Can't fucking think, ho. He grabbed his phone. No answer. Leave a message. Bye, Kurtz. The cops are here. Click. Stagger looked down at his finger outside the trigger guard, yelled through the door at the police on the other side. Fuck you, motherfuckers! Fuck! Ah! Bang. Yawn 93. Donovan. GM2. I was working aboard Alcatraz passenger ferries for the National Park Service. My inexperienced captain was a decade younger than me, but he had a dick twice the size of mine. I had befriended a deckhand, a salty kid named Dan, and we had encouraged him to get his merchant mariner credential. When Dan said he needed to drive to San Diego for the weekend, and Donovan contacted me saying he was leaving rehab and had a week of free time to kill, we all teamed up and rode with Dan down Highway 5 to San Diego. In San Diego, Donovan announced he would rent a room for himself and that we shouldn't bother him until it was time to go, as he needed to free his mind and type. Every so often, we'd catch a glimpse of Donovan opening the door for a ladyboy or a cracked-out prostitute. The morning of our last day, Dan went to his class and I went to get Donovan, anticipating the need to pull him together and toss him in the shower. He wouldn't answer his door and I finally convinced the front officer manager let me in the room. When the door opened, a thick fog of cigarette smoke came barreling out. Seeing the concern of the hotel manager, I quickly jumped in the room and slammed the door shut behind me. There was a bathroom light on, and through the burning smoke, I could make out a figure on the bed, and soon saw Donovan spread out over his bed, ass naked. He was bloated and caked in sweat. There was a full ashtray on the bed beside him, with the cigarette still burning. Good, he's not dead. His typewriter sat on the bed beside the desk and torn paper was everywhere. Bottles of liquor scattered, 10, 20 maybe, all empty. Donovan, Donovan, you alive, bud? A few mumbles and a throat clear. He remained face down as he talked. Sure, you remember when I went to that show with Gilmore and Dev? Yeah, bud, why? I fucked Dev that night. Old Jack ashore, student. Old man down, down by the docks of the city. Couldn't see me, he asked me for a cup of coffee. Well, I got no money, you can drink mine, fella, if you'll tell me a story. My name is August West. Blue Jay wasn't aware of my reasons for meeting him under the Campanile. Almost by coincidence, it was the perfect location between our two homes, and my classes were nearby. The Campanile When Richard Henry Dana Jr. returned to San Francisco in 1859, he was struck silent by the tremendous change. Ten years earlier, the entire state of California was obtained by the United States, which seemed arbitrary as the fur industry was drying up with the near extinction of the furry animals there. As if some sort of conspiracy was at play, Gold was discovered in the eastern portion of the state months after the USA acquired it. San Francisco Bay was the mouth that fed the gold rush. Then, it was the asshole that shit it out. The number of sailors entering the bay grew by tens of thousands, year after year, in that short decade. Interested in the first true economic gold mine of its existence, the United States sent the Army to supervise the chaos. The Army erected its first fort on Alcatraz Island, along with a lighthouse in 1855, to warn every sailor who passed through the Golden Gate Straits, of who was in charge. The vessels entering the bay were all ocean-going boats, 
which were forced to land in deep waters against the San Francisco city front. Within years, derelict boats were the primary threat to undermining the gold industry. The army responded by building a citadel on Alcatraz with prison and gallows. Sailors and captains caught abandoning their vessels would be charged, confined, and even hung on Alcatraz Island. Imagine the six-month voyage to San Francisco with little to do other than spin yarns over the newly discovered gold. You'd abandon your ship too, I bet. As Dana passed through the Golden Gate, he saw Alcatraz Lighthouse, and he was perturbed by it. He knew it was not a beacon. It was an intimidator. On Dana's return visit, he met with California's governor, Henry Haight. The two spoke about the dire need to help the growing society of misfits, adventure seekers, and lawbreakers. As a lawyer, Dana was mainly interested in establishing a school of law. As a public officer, Haight was interested in a little bit more. The rough outlines were introduced to erect a school for failed miners and sailors, using federal money set aside for new landowners to develop their land for agricultural purposes. And as a little icing on the cake, Dana requested a lighthouse structure to be built to overpower the medieval lighthouse on Alcatraz. It took less than five years for California to purchase and begin building what is now the UC Berkeley campus on the eastern side of San Francisco Bay. The campus's lighthouse did not receive its funding, but was noted in the initial planning stages. At the turn of the 20th century, a successful writer sat down at Heinold's saloon with the head of UC Berkeley to discuss the social problems evolving from the school. Upset by the high class population overwhelming the school and destroying its original mission to provide for the low class, Benjamin Wheeler asked Jack London to be a guest lecturer for a semester to help draw in a more diverse population of students. This conversation made little progress as Jack London was anxiously awaiting the opportunity to set sail across the Pacific. However, Wheeler told the Dana Lighthouse story to London. Jack made a few calculations and noted that a lighthouse built in the correct location on the campus would act as a giant range marker when accounting for the center of the Golden Gate Strait and the Alcatraz Lighthouse. Jack was tickled by this and volunteered his time to progressing the concept. In 1905, London found a private contractor to build the structure and, pending his return from a planned voyage around the globe, he committed to drumming up interest in the campus via the iconic lighthouse and all that it represented. Then, a major event happened. In 1906, a major earthquake sent the plans of building a tower into oblivion, and Jack London's sailing vessel was battered by a small tsunami that swept through present-day Jack London Square. The tsunami was caused by a chunk of Yerba Buena Island falling into the bay, which sent a wall of water five feet high rushing through the Oakland estuary. The following year, Jack was occupied repairing his vessel and setting sail for Hawaii. In 1908, the Alcatraz lighthouse was demolished due to the earthquake's damage from two years before. A taller lighthouse was built on the opposite side of the island within a year. In 1909, a prominent Berkeley resident dropped dead, and his wife agreed to donate the family fortune to UC Berkeley if they agreed to erect a monument to honor her husband. The campus agreed and the plans for the lighthouse were thrown into the spotlight once more. The widow, last name of Sather, didn't like the concept of a light beacon and agreed to the plans only if the light was replaced with bells instead. No person was present to argue on behalf of the original plans and the tower was donned with bells instead of a light. Also, no one understood Jack London's plan to align the tower with the lighthouse on Alcatraz. And when the Alcatraz lighthouse was rebuilt in a different location to the south, the Campanile's location became off-centered, ruining a perfect range marker for the campus and the Golden Gate Straits by a significant two degrees north. Jack London returned haggard from seasickness and tropical infections. Upon his return, he noted the Campanile in the distance, off-centered with no light, and his spirits failed him. He refused to promote the Sather Tower, the Campanile, or the university, and the working sailor once more was placed at a disadvantage due to some wealthy bitch and her affection for bells. Unfortunately, Schools around the states are still attended by the privileged instead of the needy, and sailors have some of the lowest attendance and graduation rates. But a good idea is a good idea, and an industrious student from UC Berkeley learned of the campus's start and the tragedy of the Campanile. For the tower's 100th year, he designed a giant solar beacon which could attract attention from ships entering the Golden Gate, finally. Blue Jay and I sit smoking by a no-smoking sign beneath the 300-foot tower. He's ignorant of the tower's history and the reason I choose to come here. He stares at young women through his shades as I gaze and wait for incoming ships. Maybe it will be me on lookout. Flick cigarettes into the wavy grass. Dawn dark sunglasses. Sailors should never become racked. Shit, I'm going to be late for class. Footnote 119. Undermine. To dig beneath the foundation. Create instability. It's ironic to undermine a mining operation. And it's absurd, but true, that seafarers threaten the stability of gold mines. Assuming you frame the economy in mind, maybe the gold threatened the stability of the seafarers.
Line, dot, dot, dot. Decision review officer, as I was saying, how's this for insufficient, assholes? And now that I have it out, I have doubt. <laughs> Maybe if I added a few more explosions or falls from the Jack Cross, you'd find this more compelling. Maybe these yarns will be made into my noose. Or maybe, without any luck, it will be braided into a captain's daughter and come to rest on my gingerbread work. I digress. I wonder which ad won me over as a righteous kid. Which image? Are there any studies on false advertising and customer unhappiness? We bought into values that never existed as such. Everyday heroes, dignity and pride, nationalism, the Coast Guard's message, honor, respect, devotion to duty, Perception is everything. Looking back, my post was to protect an image. Officer presence, and the rest follows, is what they said. I'm sure that facade has done wonders for the people labeled other than honorable. It's worked its magic on the head of those on bar stools, on helm stools, and standing on the quay waving. Where's the win-win with that perception philosophy? Authenticity is what's needed. Real humans on both sides of the bulwark. I'll listen to a man who tells the truth despite its short-term cost, faster than a man with a fake smile and handshake. Those plastic faces are the first symptoms of betrayal. The art of perception doesn't hold up universally in the age of information. The lies are now preconceived because of the art's long-term use. Who's fighting for beacons? Who fights for the intimidators? Who's standing guard over all this suffering, this senseless drama? My lungs are sore. My throat is more coarse. Bradley's drooling over there on the typewriter. He's about drunk, I suspect. Time to put this thing on the hard. You know which dock I sail from. Pole Jack ashore. Footnote 120. Gingerbread work. The detailed and skilled wood carvings of the stern of a 15th or 16th century Carrick or Galleon. Shitting off the stern of a vessel is prohibited because it will ruin the gingerbread work. 121. On the hard. A literal reference to hauling a ship onto land for repairs. About the author. Bradley Engel served his enlistment in the United States Coast Guard from 2002 to 2007. His service started on a seagoing cutter which traveled from the equator to the coast of Russia. His later career was in maritime law enforcement, where he spent countless deployments throughout the coastal states. Bradley left the Coast Guard honorably as an E-4 as a result of his second mast. From 2009 to the present, Bradley has worked on multiple entrepreneurial projects and he actively operates a source for scanty maritime information under the name Dirty Sailor Company, DirtySailorCompany.com. With a degree in behavioral science and a master's in business administration, Engel focuses on his life's passions, the maritime sociocultural environment. His ultimate goal is to understand the relationship between maritime culture and shoreside communities and how that relationship adapts to shifts in technology, environmental, economic, social, and regulatory conditions. Bradley Uncensored in South Hawaii, I sat in olivine sands, allowing the uprushing swash to force grit and salt over my naked lap. Gazing at the water, I disappeared into a dimension of polychromes and dreams. There, I basked in some sort of great feeling of wonder, which I've never been able to articulate to others. This same polychrome feeling existed 20 years ago, when I signed my enlistment papers for the United States Coast Guard. They surely tried to scrub it off. BTA. And that concludes Shipmates Before the Mast, a Coasties Chronicle of the Dishonorable by Bradley Engel, published by Dirty Sailor Company, copyright 2019.